All right, let's let's talk about Tisha B'Av for a little bit. So Tisha B'Av is this Saturday night until Sunday night, and there were five tragedies that happened on Tisha B'Av that Chazal talk about. So the first thing that happened was the spies came back with a bad report of the land of Israel, something we've talked about here. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians on the ninth of Av. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, the other thing that happened was the city of Betar was destroyed which was a very big tragedy. It seems that hundreds of thousands of Jews, if not millions, were killed. Now there's actually a very vibrant religious community that's in uh, Betar. That's, uh, it's in Israel also. And also, uh, the last thing that happened was the remnants of the temple, whatever was left after the destruction, was plowed over by a later Roman, uh, Roman emperor. Now, other things which happened was, I couldn't verify this, but they say that the expulsion of the Jews from England happened on Tisha B'Av. It was 1290. So I, did the, I, I plugged in the date. I think it was the 18th of July, 1290? Somewhere around there, sometime in July 1290. So it was very close to Tisha B'Av. I plugged in the English date in the English Hebrew calendar converter, mm-hmm. and they had a little note that said, since uh, Pope Gregory changed the calendar in 15-whatever or 17-whatever, so we can't tell you if it's exact or not, but it came out to the 2nd of Av, so maybe if you adjust it, it would be the 9th of Av, but it was mm-hmm. definitely definitely around that time. And I just I saw an article that the, that's it, the uh, Anglican Church might apologize Soon for the expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290. So if anyone was waiting for that, thanks. But yeah, <laughs> it wasn't even the Anglican Church at the time; it was the Catholic Church that uh, that was in England. And then also they say the uh, I also didn't check this one out, but the expulsion of Jews from Spain happened. They say on Tisha B'Av and World War One. This I did check out once. That one of the I forgot which country it was, but you know for like a week they were declaring war on each other, and one of the countries declared war on the other on Tisha B'Av. So it's a day which is filled with tragedy, and primarily we're mourning for the uh, destruction of the temples. And, you know, very religious Jews, they never had a separate day for Holocaust Remembrance Day because Tisha B'Av was the day when they commemorate uh, also the tragedy of the Holocaust. So there are kinos that were, uh, lamentations that were composed to talk about the tragedy of the Holocaust. And this is the day of national mourning when we mourn all of the tragedies and all of the bad things that happened to the Jewish people. So since this year is kind of unique. So I just want to mention a few of the laws this year, which come are a little different than other years. This year is unique because Tisha B'Av starts Saturday night, starts right after Shabbos. So usually before Tisha B'Av we have something called the Sudas Hamavsekas, which is the last meal before Tisha B'Av. So the last meal before Tisha B'Av you eat on the ground, and you wash. You have a piece of bread, and you have an egg which is dipped in ashes. It's like a meal of a mourner. And you, you don't make a zimun. You don't have three men eat together. So everyone sits together separately on the floor and has this meal. So we don't do this this year on Shabbos because it's Shabbos. You have Shal Shudas is the regular, is the last meal that you eat. And in fact, since Shabbos is the day before Tisha B'Av, and even though during the nine days we don't eat meat, that's why we have Kugel tonight and not Chalant. Uh, I don't even, even bother with the par of Chalant stuff. It's not uh, worth it. I don't even know if they sell it anywhere. You know, just go with Kugel. You know, if you're not going to do Chalant right, don't, don't do it at all. And they didn't make a seam so we could have meat, but uh, yeah. So, but on Shabbos, during the nine days, you're allowed to eat meat so th- and drink wine. So th- since this Shabbos is the day before Tisha B'Av, it's still it's part of the nine days, but it's the uh, last day of the nine days is on Shabbos, so you're allowed to eat meat. So the Shal Shudas, you can even have meat. It's the last meal, that, right? A second before Tisha B'Av, you can still eat meat this year. So Shal Shudas is the last uh, time you could eat, and we don't do the whole thing with the bread and the egg this year and the ashes. So in Manalapan, you have to finish Shal Shudas be- before 8.24. 8.24 is Shkia, is sunset. I don't know what time in Freehold, but I assume it's around 8.24, maybe 8.23, 8.25. No, Freehold's Freehold south. Right. So not It'll be interesting if like one end of Manalapan is like different. Oh, I'm curious like how, how many seconds is different from like the eastern end of Manalapan to the western end. it be interesting. Anyway, you need to find an astronomer. Okay, so for Havdalah, we don't do a regular Havdalah because when we make Havdalah, we can't eat. We're fasting on Tisha B'Av. So what we do is we make Havdalah on the candle alone on Saturday night. So that's usually done in synagogue uh, before they read the book of Echa. And we only, whenever we do Havdalah, uh, the candle is only done on Saturday night in general because that's when uh, the Marisha and Adam got uh, fire. Okay. And then Sunday night we make we we what do the gave him fire? he figured out how to make fire on uh, on Saturday night. Right. Yeah. That's what we do it. Yes. Oh, I don't think I need it. Yeah. Yeah. I never heard of it. Oh, thanks for coming. Nice. Yeah. Just learn something new every day, right? So here. Wait, if you knew everything else until now, then I'm kind of like maybe I should like revise my classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I made that last one up. No. So the rest of Havdalah we do Sunday night, and that's only on the wine and on grape juice. But the bracha would say Saturday night, that's only... Bore And nothing else. Nothing and else. Nothing right? else. Yeah. And that's usually done in, uh, in, in, uh, in synagogue. But I guess, assume if you want to do it for your wife, you could do it at home. Mm-hmm. Um, fine. So then... Also, if we do it here, we're going to have to do it at home. Yeah, um, I'd have to check if you... I mean, you wouldn't do it for yourself if you did it here, but maybe for your wife, or maybe have your wife do it mm-hmm. herself. Usually women don't make Havdalah by themselves, but I'm not sure about making the Bori Mariage alone, if that's something that they uh, mm-hmm. that they do. Okay, so now, fine. That's that. Now the other thing, what's the other What's the other thing that's a little different? We don't wear leather shoes on Tish B'Av. Welcome, welcome. Please take some kugel and some soda. My dad's not here. Um, he's he's here. Oh. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming. We're in South Jersey. Where are you? Uh, you know Fort River and uh, Barnegat. Oh yeah, that's far. Yeah, Barnegat. I was covering Barnegat Township. Oh wow. Uh, People at the beach. Yeah, drownings. Uh, yeah. Oh. Overdoses. Oh great. Two yards, two two dead. Oh yeah. Hey. victim, hip injury. Wow. Were they yeah, it's a very busy day. That's it. Oh, yeah. You, take another piece of kugel. <laughs> you earned it. Yeah. <laughs> take as much kugel as you want. Give some chunks. Yeah. yeah, you could have chunks. <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no chunks. Yeah, no chunks. Yeah. Hey, welcome, welcome. Take some kugel. What's it in there? I just got here. Two drownings, uh, yeah, an overdose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Two dead guys. Yeah, two, one dead girl, one dead guy. Hey. Two people. Uh, Oh, speaking of that, today is there should be Lili Nishmas. Uh, oh, I forgot. Usher Tzvi Moshe. Yeah. What? Oh, it should be in memory of Usher Tzvi Moshe, Harold Zoberg. I meant to say at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're talking about some of the laws of Tisha B'Av. Some of the things that uh, we observe this uh, this year is a little different, we said, because Tisha B'Av comes out on uh, on Sunday, right after Shabbos. So we're saying we don't wear leather shoes on Tisha B'Av. So what do we do? We're coming from Shabbos. Shabbos, we don't mourn, so we're wearing leather shoes. When do we take off our shoes? So there's two options you could do. Uh, we'll probably be at home because we live far away from Shul, so you say, Baruch HaMavdil ben Kodesh L'chol, blessed is, uh, he who separates from the holy and the profane, and then you take off your, or you take off your shoes, and then you put on your non-leather shoes. The other custom is, is that if you're in synagogue, the Chazan says, Baruch to begin Marv, he takes off his shoes before that, he says, Baruch HaMavdil, and after he says, Baruch then everybody else takes off their shoes after that. Okay, other things on Tisha B'Av, so that's the, that, those are the unique things that happen this year, there's no Sunam of Sekes, and um, Havdalah we just make on the candle, and the, and the wine we do Sunday night, and there's no <coughs> spices uh, this year. Okay, so we know Tisha B'Av, there's no eating and drinking. Uh, we don't wash. Uh, only we go to the joints of the fingers, so we wash up to here. You have to wash in the morning still, but we don't wash anything else. Uh, there's no relations. We don't learn Torah, because Torah makes a person happy. Uh, uh, the only things you can learn is like sad things, like the Book of Lamentations, the sad parts of the Book of Jeremiah, the Book of Job. It's very sad. And even if you learn them, you shouldn't learn them with a lot of commentaries, because if you start getting into the, you know, oh, he says like this one says like this, and this one says like that. Oh, it's my, what they, what's the machlokus? And you know, that, that could be geschmack. So you don't want to learn that. Uh, and you can learn about the story of the destruction of the temple, which is talked about in Tractate Gittin. All right. Echa lamentations. Echa is lamentations. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we don't uh, we, we we observe the custom of mourning. So just like a person who sits shiva doesn't sit in a regular chair, we also don't sit in a regular chair. But that we only keep until midday on Sunday, uh, because the mourning becomes a little less after midday on Sunday. The mourning is more intense then. So in Manalapan, midday halachic midday is 103, 103 p.m. So after 103 p.m. you can uh, sit in a regular chair. Also, we don't work on Tish B'Av. Uh, at least until noon, until halachic noon, which is not so relevant this year because it's on a Sunday. <coughs> what was the other thing? I was going to say one more thing. I forgot. Chair. Okay, I don't know. Fine, so those are just a summary of the laws. Now, let's talk a little bit about Tisha B'Av. I want to start with an enigmatic statement from the Arizal. The Arizal, the most famous Kabbalist of all time, who revealed a lot of secrets of Jewish mysticism. He says a very interesting thing. He says, whoever eats on Tisha B'Av, it's like he eats from the Gid Anusha. The Gid Anusha is the sciatic nerve. You could tell us about it. I don't know if you've ever had anyone with sciatica or sciatic nerve injuries. Yeah, but uh, they're usually on payments. What? They're usually on heavy payments. Do animals get sciatica? You ever treat an animal? Okay. 
So they have a sciatic nerve. So the Arizal says whoever eats on Tishabov is like he eats from this sciatic nerve, eats from the Gidonasha. What in the world does that mean? So I want to share some ideas from uh, my Rashiva, my Rebbe, Ravaran Feldman. So anyone remember why we can't eat from the Gidonasha? We don't eat, eat Gidonasha. It's a prohibition in the Torah not to eat this from the sciatic nerve of an animal. And remember why? Jacob. Okay. Yeah, Jacob. So let's, let's read what happened. I'm going to read some of the verses in Beratius and Genesis. And we'll see what happened and why we don't eat. Go over why, again, we don't eat from the sciatic nerve. It says, Yaakov Levado. Yaakov was by himself. And a man or an angel wrestled with him until dawn. The angel saw that he was not able to beat Jacob, overcome him, so he hit him in his thigh. The angel says to Jacob, let me go. It's morning's coming, and Jacob says back, I'm only going to let you go if you bless me. The angel said to him, what's your name? My name is Yaakov. He says, you're not going to be called Jacob anymore. You're going to be called Yisrael, because you fought with an angel, and you were victorious. And the word Yisrael, or Israel, comes from the root to, to fight with, to contend with, to struggle with. Because of you overcame the struggle, he changed his name from Yaakov to Yisrael. He said to the angel, what's your name? And he said, why did you ask for my name? And he blessed him. He calls the place Paniel because he saw an angel face to face and he was saved. As Penuel v'hutzalei al Yerecho, the sun rose, and he was limping because the angel hit him. And it says, verse 33, Al-Kain lo yuchol b'nei Yisrael es gid anashe, therefore the Jewish people should not eat from the sciatic nerve, asher al-kaf hayarech ad yom hazeh, even until this day, which is on the socket of the hip, ki nagu b'kaf yarech Yaakov v'gid anashe, because the angel touched his hip, and his uh, gidanasha, his sciatic nerve. And that's why we don't have a filet mignon. We don't eat from the back part of the animal because there really is a way to get out the sciatic nerve so you can eat from the back part of the animal, but we don't really bother with that anymore, so we just chop off the back part of the cow and sell it to non-Jews. So Yaakov here, the reason we don't eat the gidanasha, the sciatic nerve, is because Yaakov had a struggle with the angel Esau, with the angel of Esau. This angel who he was fighting with was the Esau's angel, his brother, his not so great brother, his evil brother, and obviously they weren't. Uh, however, a person would have a fight with an angel. You know, they weren't like uh, WWE wrestling or MMA fighting, which is crazy. You watch MMA; it's insane what what they do. I can't, can't. Like, they like they do beat each other. Yeah, the they kick and punch and like it's insane. And then they have women doing it. Uh, okay, it's crazy. It's illegal. Yeah, I know. So anyway, yeah, it's a side point. <laughs> But that's not what, you know, Yaakov was doing with the angel. It was obviously some sort of spiritual battle that they were having. And Yaakov was victorious in every area, beating Esau's angel, except for one area, where the angel hit him in the sciatic nerve. And Chazal say that the sciatic nerve represents the Jewish people throughout the generations that leave Judaism and abandon Judaism and they become part of other religions. Because that's the only part where Esau dominated Yaakov. Yaakov was victorious, showing that eventually, in the end of the day, Yaakov's ideology is going to win out. But the little bit where Esau won was represented by the Gid Anasha. Now, what were their ideologies? What was the ideology of Yaakov, our forefather, and what was the ideology of his not-so-great brother Esau? So the verse in Beresha says, in Genesis, Oh, before that, I'll say that. So Rashi, brings, Rashi cites in the Gemara says that Rome actually was a descendant of Esau. Esau was a forerunner of Edom, was a nation, and Edom was a forerunner of Rome. So therefore, when somebody eats, um, when somebody eats on Tisha B'Av, he's showing that he doesn't identify with the Jewish people because it was Rome that destroyed the temple. Rome, the descendant of Esau, destroyed the temple. And if someone eats on Tisha B'Av, he's saying he doesn't care about the victory of Rome, of Esau, over Yaakov. And that's represented by the sciatic nerve, which was the only part where the Esau's angel won over Yaakov. So when someone eats on Tisha B'Av, he's showing that he doesn't care 
about the values of the Jewish people and doesn't care about the fact that Esau was, um, was victorious in that, in that uh, area. Now, what were they fighting about? What was their ideologies? What was the ideology of Yaakov that he won in general? And what was the ideology of Esau that he won with the Gira Nasha? So the verse says in Bereshus, Genesis 25, 27, The boys grew up. Esau was a man who knew how to trap animals. Uh, he knew how to hunt. He saw the men of the fields. And Yaakov was a man who sat in tents. Yaakov sat and he learned Torah. He learned the will of Hashem. And Esau was going around hunting animals. So Unclus, who was actually a nephew of the Roman emperor who converted to Judaism, and he composed the, a translation of the Torah into Aramaic, which contains a lot of hidden wisdom. So he says an interesting word here. That in the, in the phrase of Ish Yodei a person that knows how to hunt, he said he was a Gvar Nachshirchon, a man of Nachshirchon. Well, so what does that mean? So the Tosavus in Bava Kama, 92b, he says there's two meanings of the word Nachshirchon. One meaning is a person who is easygoing and idle. He just, he's chilling. He doesn't really do anything with his life. Just no goals, everything. He just likes to be on vacation. That's one explanation. The other explanation is that Esau had the image of a snake on his thigh. Okay, so what's that mean? What's that all about? So, Marushiv explained that Esau, the purpose of his existence was man and his pleasures. He thought man is, mankind should be supreme, and the goal of everything is just to make life easier for enjoyment. Have every convenience you could have, and do whatever you can to push humanity forward so that you can indulge in all of your personal desires, all of your taivas, and self-aggrandizement, make yourself important, and just make life easy, because the goal of everything, everybody's waiting for the weekend, mm-hmm. right? Just to, just to chill. Party. Yeah. Play all the college kids. Party all the time, party all the time. Everybody's working for... Okay. <laughs> Anyone knows that? So that was, that's what he did. That's what Asa believed in. And that's really was the culture of Rome, that they had all of these inventions. They had indoor plumbing in the ancient world, which was pretty crazy. I think I've read somewhere that they still use the same, some of the same pipes from ancient Rome in the city of Rome now. So they had all these modern conveniences. You know, they were like the Dubai of the day, I guess, or whatever, whatever you want to say. Uh, but the whole goal of everything was just, you know, I want to chill. I want to go to the Roman bath, have a good time. And that's the goal of my life. There's no higher purpose. Just everything should be easy so that I can be successful in my life. Now, it's the same idea with the, with the serpent, that there was a snake on his thigh. When do we have a serpent in the Torah? Very beginning, Adam and Eve. How did the serpent entice Adam to sin, Adam and Eve? He said the following. If you eat from the tree, the tree of knowledge, when you eat from the tree, Hashem knows that your eyes will be opened up. You will be like a God knowing good and evil. Please take some kugel. Kugel. The way that they were enticed to sin, the way that the snake, the serpent, enticed Adam to sin was by saying that if you eat from the tree, you're going to be like a god. You are going to be powerful. You are going to be in charge. You're going to be all that matters. So that's how he tricked them to eat from the tree of knowledge. Very enticing thing to be important. And that's the same thing as the other explanation of Nachshirchan, that Esau was a man who just wanted to be on vacation, do everything for himself, provide for his own needs. But Yaakov, his ideology was the total opposite, the total opposite of Esau. Yaakov believed that the goal of life isn't to serve oneself, but rather to work hard, and on the contrary, to overcome his personal urges, to study Torah, to learn what Hashem wants from him, to perfect his character traits. Right? In Esau's world, there's no, there's no idea of perfecting one's character traits to become a better person. I'm going to do what I want. I want to go vacation. I want to eat this. I want to do that, do whatever I feel like. But Yaakov says, no, we have to, we're here in life to control our passions, to control ourselves, to perfect our character traits, to not be selfish. That's the ideology of Yaakov and the ideology of the Jewish people, to be a kind person and to learn how. Yaakov knows that there's a desire that people want to be autonomous and people want to have power and people want to be in charge. But Yaakov says, no, we have to learn how to control that and channel that to serve Hashem. To, to Yaakov, to summarize, the goal of life is to serve Hashem, and to Esau, the goal of life is to serve himself. So that represents, the Gid Anusha represents that, la- that little bit where the, where the angel of Esau was victorious 
was in that ideology to only live life to serve oneself. And if someone eats on Tishbev, he's saying that I identify with the ideology of Esau, that I also want to live for myself, and I don't care about the values of the Jewish people. And if we remember, we talked about this a little bit before, Rome, it's everything that happens is mida connected mida, measure for measure. Why was the Second Temple destroyed? We all know, sinas chinam, baseless hatred, because everyone was out for themselves. The Jewish people, we lost sight of our mission, and we only cared about ourselves. We didn't care about other people. We hated people for no reason, right? If, if, if all I care about is me, then I don't care about anybody else. I don't care what anyone else has to do. So since the Jewish people had, you know, went down this route of sinas chinam, of baseless hatred, that's why it was specifically Rome, which was a nation which was dedicated to self-aggrandizement, that destroyed the Jewish people, that destroyed the temple, excuse me, because the Jewish people were not acting properly to each other and were too self-centered, and that's why they had baseless hatred to, to one another. You know, if you think of, uh, you know, just the two ideologies, how do you react in the situation at work? You have the opportunity to slander somebody at work or to say something negative, and it'll get you ahead. It'll get you uh, a promotion. It'll get you a higher paycheck. So if you're ace of, for sure, do it. That's the whole point of life, is to get ahead, to, you know, to... Um, to be to be important to get and get a lot of money so that I can uh, you know do whatever I want for myself. But if you're Yaakov, you say no. The whole point of life is that I should conquer my Sahara, I should conquer these passions, and I should live for other people. In fact, I shouldn't be slandering somebody else to get ahead. I should help him so he can get ahead and not me. That's the ideology of Yaakov. Now, obviously, that's easier said than done. But when we know what the goal is, when we know that we're from the Jewish people, that we have these values and we have these midas in our DNA, then that makes it a lot uh, a lot easier. Um, it's very interesting there's a I won't talk too much about it but there's a show on Netflix that came out that a lot of people are talking about called My Unorthodox Life Mm -hmm. it's about a woman who claims that she was you know she came from this oppressive ultra-orthodox culture where they put her down and she just wanted to you know break free so she became a uh, somehow she became a CEO of this uh Fashion company, it could be something to do that she married the chairman of the board. I'm not sure. You know, maybe it was all on talent, but it could be also that she became this uh, high position because she married the guy. And the whole, first of all, it's interesting because someone posted on Facebook today, someone who knew her when she was a kid and said, like, the stuff she was saying was a lie. She came from, like, you know, she portrayed herself like she was from this, like, insular Hasidic community that she never heard of TV or anything. But someone who knew her as a kid said that wasn't true, like she was from a much more modern uh, community. But you hear what she's talking about. She's writing, all, she's writing all these things about um, not caring about how her children feel because she has to feel empowered and satisfy herself. So you just see how the ideology went from, you know, you're in a Jewish culture, no one ever think about putting these private details on TV that would hurt the people closest to you, but she does that because now her ideology is, you know, I have to be empowered, I have to be a proud person and do all these things to, to be successful. Okay, there's a lot more to say on Tisha B'Av, but uh, we'll finish here because apparently there's a uh, mincha now. And so uh, thanks for coming.